Bill Sell here with the 2012 Bio International Convention in Boston. It's Wednesday, the third day of programming here. The convention is really heated up here. We have lots of interviews going on, meetings. We've also been watching and tracking a lot of progress, the conference sessions, super sessions, keynotes. A lot is going on. Please stay with us here on the 2012 Bio International Convention video show daily. Well, I think, you know, the Vertex decision to come to Boston, um, that spurred a lot of other companies who are talking with us right now who want to come to the city of Boston. Uh, they see a climate here that uh, it's uh, amenable to their uh, growth and uh, the brain power we have here and the research being done with the uh, Harvard announcement last week of uh, the stem cell over in uh, that part of the city. And, uh, and tomorrow we'll break ground on the new uh, Longwood Center. There's, uh, it's an exciting place with Bio Boston. We have the brain power too. That's one of the things that we don't have to import our brain power. We have it all right here, and uh, that's a real advantage from other cities. And uh, my administration and the governor's administration, we are uh, very pro bio, and we want to make sure that because that's the research, that's the jobs of the future, that's the healthcare we'll have uh, as we get grow older. Tom, you mentioned education, which is such a key thing for this whole industry and for jobs in the future. You also stress the government, the, the government role, the NIH, the federal government's role. Talk a little bit, because that's controversial these days. No question about it. That's one thing I'm, I'm concerned about a lot, is that will the federal government stay with us on this issue? I think we have to organize and uh, make sure the federal government understands the research that's being done there, but also that jobs create. Everybody talks about jobs. This is one of those industries that creates jobs every day. So we have to continue to help them uh, get the necessary funds to continue the growth of the bio industry in America, and especially in the city of Boston. We're number one when it comes to bio, but uh, that's what we have to teach the, uh, educate our Congress about. This is about jobs. It's about a healthier America. And uh, there's no downside to it as I look at it. Hello, this is Dan Terrace for Bio Video Daily Show. I'm here live at the Business Forum with Joe. How are How you? How you doing, Dan? Good, thanks. And what do you do for, uh, for Bio? Uh, so I'm the Director of Business Development here at Bio, but my chief responsibility is uh, working with the Bio one-on-one -on -one partnering system and uh, setting up and helping to set up one, you know, many of these 25,000 meetings that we have here today at Bio. 25,000. Yeah, that's right. It's quite a new, impressive. A new record for 2012. And how do you keep all of this organized? Uh, the backbone of the system is our bio one-on-one -on -one partnering system. And so uh, what the technology allows the uh, attendee to do is search out and seek their next partner, whether it's a biotech company, a service provider of the industry, a uh, law firm, any real partner in the industry surrounding life sciences and biotech. And then uh, we, we set meeting points and the times that they have to meet, we, court, we uh, do all the logistics for it. And as you can see behind us, uh, there, right now there's about 358 meetings going on. That's amazing. And what kind of companies are here looking looking for partnerships? Uh, the majority of the companies here are life science, pharma, and biotech companies. Uh, however, we do see some uh, additional other companies that are supported by the industry, work with the industry, such as accounting firms, law firms, uh, CROs, CMOs, and other types of services. And uh, do international companies participate in this as well? Absolutely, in particular at this event. Uh, so the international uh, de delegations send a lot of folks from this event. It's a great way to get a great international sampling here in the business form and in the partnering system. We have co companies from over 58 countries uh, and from really all over the globe. It's actually pretty, pretty amazing every year to see the group come in. This seems pretty unique. Is there anything comparable out there with other organizations? Uh, we, you know, Bio does uh, a series of other events and, and other uh, geographies, um, but nothing has the breadth and the width of the international uh, presence as this event. How much of this would you say is sort of a person looking for a position versus a company looking for a partner? Oh, I would say 99, over 99 percent of it is a company looking for a partner. These are all B two B meetings, absolutely. B two B, okay. And how do you follow the metrics of how this works? 
Well, as you can see, it's it's a pretty big logistical uptaking. So we, we track the metrics very closely, uh, not only while we get on site, but many weeks in advance to make sure that we have the physical infrastructure possible to facilitate all these meetings, to make sure the software is operational so that our users really have the highest quality experience possible. And, and roughly how many partnerships come out of these kinds of meetings, any any sense for that? So it's it's interesting, that's uh, something that we, we constantly try to monitor and uh, some companies do come forward and say, yeah, you know, a partnership did result from these meetings. But in reality, uh, these partnering meetings are a great, great way to make the first connections, uh, to make secondary and third or old friends catching up because they have an existing partnership. And so it's hard for us to put a number on it, but I can tell you that over the last five years since we were in Boston in 2007, the number of partnering meetings and the number of people in partnering has jumped by over 100%. And so that trend alone tells us that we're onto something. That, that clearly shows you a trend. Yeah, so, exactly. So that is very good. This is Dan Terrace for Bio Video Daily Show. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dan. Pleasure. Hello, Bill Sell here with the Bio Video Show Daily and my guest this morning, Maria Marshall, with the Spanish uh, Trade Administration in um, Chicago. And then uh, we also have Raul Vina. And you're actually from Spain and you're working with uh, the Institute there, bringing organizations not just to the U.S. but around the world. That's right. Okay. Now, the delegation that you brought here, Maria, uh, this is your eighth year coming back to Bio. Talk a little bit about uh, you come back every year. That is correct. Uh, we have uh, been exhibiting for eight years in a row. We started with nine companies back in 2004, and we increased the number of companies to um, 100 in 2010. Oh, so it's been a great it, It's uh, excellent increase. growth there now. And uh, in terms of what these companies are here for, they're here for partnering when they come and, and uh, visit here in the U.S. Correct. That's one of the main reasons. The partnering, it's uh, one of our main goals. Uh, this year, for instance, we have 400 uh, partnering contacts that have been established already, so we're happy about oh, that's that. Excellent. 400 meetings in four days, basically, is what this is. Yes. And what kinds of meetings are these? Who would be these kinds of companies? Are they all from Spain meeting from Spain, or they meet globally? They will be globally. Okay. Uh, the majority will be companies that are based here in the U.S. Okay, it's a great. One. Now, the objectives that you'd set forth for the week when you're coming over here to the U.S. and, and bringing a delegation like this, what are, are the, the goals that you may have set for this kind of a, a program? Okay, for the Spanish delegation, being here at Bio is very important. And not only because it's the most important show worldwide and the visibility is very important for us, but also we are very much concerned in developing uh, new, uh, new collaborations uh, with the uh, U.S. companies, both at technical level, commercial level, and also financial level. In terms of the, the market in Spain for the, the life sciences and for biotech, how is that market doing over there? Okay. Um, Spain, uh, Spain has got a very uh, strong scientific base, which allows the private industry to be very active in the development of new molecules. Besides that, uh, Spain has got a perfectly integrated public uh, healthcare sector, which allows the development of public-private partnership between private companies and public hospitals. This is a very good advantage for us. Mm -hmm. And thirdly, I would like to highlight that Spain benefits from a well-developed scientific and technological network. This, uh, this along with the pr promising biotech sector, makes it a very strong, uh, very strong um, country in the mm -hmm. biotech industry. And it, obviously with 400 meetings here, there's a lot of activity going on yeah, as indeed. part of this. And, and that's only what's here as part of the program. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of uh, the pavilion that you've got uh, here today, you actually have a, a very significant, important guest coming over. His Royal Highness will be coming this week. Yes, um, it is part of a promotional work that we do with uh, trade shows. Um, a political agenda representation is very important. And this year, we will have the presence of His Royal Highness, Prince Felipe of Asturias. Oh, excellent. Um, also, we have um, the Spanish Secretary of State of Commerce and the Spanish Ambassador will be also present. So we're very happy about this. And they presence. all take part in meetings as well. So some of yes, these 400 are part of that. Yes. 
and the companies that they're meeting with, is it strictly on a commercial level that they're No, um, the companies are very, uh, are pre-selected. Mm -hmm. uh, this year we kept it very intimate with pre-selected companies mm -hmm. in a private room with, with the Prince. That's a great way to do that, yeah. Yes. In terms of the looking forward here, you know, the, the market in Spain for the life sciences really is looking like it's, it's still growing very rapidly at this point. It is indeed. Uh, Spanish biotech sector is growing, um, let's say, 15% per year at a pace of 15% per year, which is uh, which is it's strong growth. I yeah, mean, much stronger than yeah. even other European countries uh, who have got a very well developed biotech sector. Yeah. So then, when you look at pavilions for next year, it could be even larger and and more active even, and it'll be in your home city of Chicago next year. Yes, um, we're very excited. Uh, we already started planning yesterday. Okay. We selected our space. Uh, we are hoping to keep the number of uh, 100 companies at the pavilion, mm -hmm. and we're looking forward to it, especially being in Chicago next year. Well, I appreciate you joining me here today, talking about the, the growing Spanish market and the Spanish pavilion and the program that you have. Thank you. So, thank, thank you for you joining much. me on the show daily. It takes 10 gallons of water to produce one slice of bread, 35 gallons to make one cup of coffee, 635 gallons to make one hamburger. With global population expected to increase by 30% by 2050, and more developing nations transitioning to higher standards of living, regional water shortages and peak water issues will become more widespread. Only 2.5% of the world's water supply is fresh. And less than 1% of fresh water is accessible surface water, with the rest locked up in snow covers, glaciers, and underground aquifers. While North America has 15% of the world's fresh water supply and 8% of the population, China is the inverse with 7% of the world's fresh water supply and 21% of the world's population. According to some estimates, a billion people today live without access to clean drinking water. Global consumption of water is expected to increase by 40% over the next 20 years. And according to some estimates, more than half of the world's population could be living under conditions of water stress by 2025. This water stress could further exacerbate regional water issues and border disputes. This is already happening in the Middle East. Agriculture consumes 70% of the world's fresh water supply. And as water constraints rise, so will the food costs. There is no substitute for water. And the supply of water is essentially fixed we will have to increasingly rely on higher cost water desalination technologies, water reuse, and conservation. While the world is not going to run out of water, as these technologies help unlock more water supply at higher cost, water becoming a more costly and regionally more scarce resource will have massive economic, ecological, and geopolitical implications. Think about it. We do. The Massachusetts economy uh, is fueled on innovation and uh, that's all about education and workforce training and our efforts around 
STEM, uh, science, technology, engineering, and math, working with our schools, working with business partners, working with institutions. The Commonwealth is the center internationally of life sciences activity and, and research, and it's the added bonus of working in this area that we're not only providing good jobs at, at very good wages for Massachusetts residents, but we're solving uh, problems around the world and people's lives will be better for it. It's certainly an important presence and it's good to be with the Mass uh, the Pavilion Booth, the Mass Life Science folks. We all have uh, similar interest in uh, life science thriving in Massachusetts and of course I believe it already thrives in Cambridge. Massachusetts is right on target. We're spot on. We're where we are putting a lot of our time, energy, and resources. There's a lot of industries that are exploding in Massachusetts right now, and it's been it's no coincidence that they're exploding. It's been a concerted effort. I think the Senate, the House, the governor, we've all taken leads in developing and targeting a lot of our, our resources and helping these industries, in particular life sciences and bio come to Massachusetts, grow in Massachusetts. The fact that Cambridge is small and dense and scientists and very, very smart people run into each other. They bump into each other at coffee shops and at restaurants and the amount of restaurants that have sprung up in Kendall Square just make all that much easier to happen. So there are people who uh, describe Kendall Square as the most innovative square mile on the planet. I wouldn't go that far, but it may be true. I can't measure it. Hello, Bill Sell here with the Bio Video Show Daily and uh, Tracy Callahan, the community director here. What is Biogenetic doing with the community? And talk a little bit about this program. Sure. The goal of this program really was to get more kids excited about science. And so we really wanted to kind of reach out to the community in a meaningful way. And we have tons of biotech companies right in the backyard in Cambridge, Somerville, Boston. And most of the students are unaware of that. So this is an opportunity to kind of make them aware of both sort of the career opportunities and the excitement that comes with working at a biotechnology company. So we bring them in and give them a chance to do some hands-on experiments as well as interact with our employees. And is this something that is done year-round, or is this just a, like a camp program? No, or? it's year-round. So during the school year, a teacher would sign up to bring in their class, and we do 6th through 12th grade. And so they would come in for sort of a one-day field trip. Mm -hmm. And then in the summer, we do run a summer program. So we have a week-long summer program that we offer multiple times, as well as an advanced two-week program. So the program that you're doing here, you're showing an example. It was uh, leukemia and uh, you're bringing up and then actually checking out the DNA. How does that work? Right, so yeah, we're looking at the idea is pharmacogenomics. So sort of the future of medicine is to be able to do genetic testing, determine if a patient's gonna respond well to a particular drug or not. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, we can't actually do that with any of the current medications that Biogenetic sells, but hopefully we'll get there at some point. So this is an example based on another medication that's not one of ours, where we can look at the patient's DNA and see if it's the correct sequence or not to um, for an enzyme that will metabolize the drug properly. So basically, okay. by doing this test, we can determine, will this drug you know, be tolerated by this patient or not? And is this done? It's patient by patient. So this is really mm -hmm. a rather tedious process. So there's a lot of lab work involved. There is. I mean, we've obviously shortened it a little bit, made it simpler for the students since mm -hmm. they're just there for a couple of hours. Okay. So describe the process. So that we actually see how they're going to be mm -hmm. uh, extracting some of the DNA sample. So yes, yeah, so the DNA samples have already been prepared, and so we have just that section of a patient's DNA that's their particular, the gene that we're interested in, and then we can take something called a restriction enzyme, and that looks for a particular sequence, and we'll cut the DNA of that sequence. And so the idea is if they have the correct sequence, it'll cut in certain locations, and you'll get pieces that are certain sizes. If they have a mutation, and so then when the enzyme comes in, it doesn't see that sequence, and it won't cut it in the same location. So we'll get a different number, different sized pieces. Okay, it leaves it behind, essentially. So, yeah. Right, exactly. So then we have these you know, cut up pieces, but we still can't see them because they're so small in the tube. So then we run them on something called a gel. It's kind of like a jello, sort of. And so you can run the samples through. It's like a matrix. So we pull it through with electricity, and the smaller pieces can go through faster. They just can wiggle their way through faster, and the bigger pieces get stuck. So they separate out by size. And then um, the DNA is treated with something that will fluoresce with UV light. So as we run it through the gel, we can then shine the UV light on it, and we'll sort of see where the pieces of DNA are. And we can estimate the size, and therefore determine 
was it the you know the pieces we expected for the correct sequence or is it the pieces and sizes we expect for the faulty and it's a fascinating experiment mm -hmm. it's a great way to show how this works and mm -hmm. literally in a matter of about 10 minutes you're actually able to yes yeah, so this is sort of our mini version um, okay. when we the samples are already kind of prepped and ready to go um, but when we do it with the students it takes about three hours because they actually do the digest of the sample themselves they will make the gels themselves load it we'll use um, different gels that take longer to run so mm -hmm. we've managed to condense you know three to four hours into about 10 minutes here. What's Biogenetic doing with the academic community then? So get a look at it at the college level. Is this a sim similar kind of program and college outreach? So um, at the college level, we have a summer internship program. So college students can apply for that and they get a chance to work in one of our departments for so it's a paid summer internship. Um, so that's kind of the main focus, I think, right now of our college program. Okay. Well, thank you. This is a, a fabulous yeah. program for the thank community you. and uh, it's a great way to bring the students in and teach them a little bit about what's yeah. going on here. Exactly. We're excited to do it. Hopefully we get a few future scientists out of it as well. Uh, that so. sounds like it will happen. Well, thank you right. very much, Thanks. Tracy. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on the video show daily. There are 1.7 million known species of life on Earth. Two years ago, scientists introduced the first one ever designed by a computer. And in the last 10 years, there have been over 3,000 patents issued for genetically modified organisms and other transgenic innovations. Within 50 years, we could have more life forms invented in the lab than we've ever identified in nature. We now have goats, whose milk can be spun into spider silk that's stronger than steel. Jumbo salmon that grow twice as fast as their natural cousins. Bacteria that produce anti-malarial drugs once available only from plants. Innovations like these can increase the supply of essential products, inspire new investing ideas, and launch or upend entire industries. It's all part of a new science called synthetic biology, using nature as a manufacturing platform and DNA as the raw material. Pharmaceutical companies see it as a pipeline for extraordinary new drugs and treatments. Energy companies see a route to cleaner, more sustainable fuels, like algae that produce biofuels and eat carbon dioxide. Someday, computers may run on DNA-based circuits, and biological paint could help heat and cool your home. Around the world, across borders, academics, entrepreneurs, and even students are working with over 5,000 DNA sequences called BioBricks to explore ideas and invent new organisms. The DNA is available online in an open source database and a collaborative crowdsourced approach means experiments that used to take years now take weeks, constantly redefining what's possible. Although synthetic biology is still in a very early experimental phase, it could become the defining technology of the 21st century bringing with it radical new thinking, new questions, and new opportunities. Because nothing has the power to change how we live more than changing life itself. Think about it. We do. Growing stem cells continuously in large numbers is extremely difficult. People have not grown scaffoldless tissue before. There is no other technology quite like it. This bioreactor actually offers the opportunity to take a very small number of a patient's cells, and they needn't necessarily be of the exact cell type that you need, de-differentiating them and then amplifying those cells up to be used in therapy. So this technology has the potential to deliver a number of types of biological material that previously, I believe, is, has not been possible. We can go to an academic conference and we can talk about the science involved, but to develop it into a commercial product, to get it into a clinic, it takes um, a conference such as BIO and it takes a panel such as the one I'm involved in where those people right, are looking to the future.
Hello, this is Dan Terrace for the Bio Video Daily Show, and I'm here with Jeff Mim from Miami, Florida, and he's an expert in uh, transdermal delivery of drugs. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Dan. I'm with Novin Pharmaceuticals, and we're a Miami-based specialty pharmaceutical company. We have a number of prescription products on the market, but our core focus is, as you said, trans prescription transdermal patches. We have the market-leading estrogen patch, a patch called Vivel Dot, which we uh, market through a joint venture with Novartis. We also have our own sales force that promotes Detrana, which is the first and only patch indicated for the treatment of ADHD. For ADHD? Oh, that's, that's right. That's an interesting. It's a good way to deliver drugs, isn't it? It has a real advantage over pills, and that is you can't unswallow a pill where you can take off the patch. As you know, these are stimulants, and at the end of the day, the side effects of, of those drugs are insomnia, and loss of appetite. Detrana allows the, the, the parent to take off the patch during the day to tailor the dose to the child. So if the child has an exam in the morning and needs the medication but doesn't need it in the afternoon, take off the patch at noon and you'll reduce those late day side effects. That's interesting because I thought the patch would stay on and you get a steady blood level all the time. Taking the patch off, I think, is an well, you can do that too. It, interesting use. It does have steady dose delivery for nine hours, but it, it allows you know, some some bit of personalized medicine where you're able to tailor the dose to the individual. I like that. Tell me a little bit about the history of the company and how you started, who you partnered with. Absolutely. So Novin is celebrating its 25th anniversary this year. We were founded in 1987 in Miami, Florida. We were really um, came out of the ashes of an acquisition in 1987 of key pharmaceuticals by Shearing Plow in the South Florida area. Three companies uh, rose from the ashes of that acquisition. One was Ivax, since acquired by Teva. Another was Coase, since acquired, I believe, by Abbott and then Novin Pharmaceuticals. Uh, we were a public company up until 2009 when we were acquired by Hisamitsu Pharmaceuticals Inc., which is the world's largest manufacturer of patches. And mm -hmm. they chose Novin as their standalone growth platform in the United States uh, to, to develop this market. So you must be very uh, active at this kind of a meeting with partners. Absolutely. We have a, uh, a full dance card over the, uh, <laughs> uh, the, the four days, uh, back to back to back. And here I thought it was a dating service. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. This is Dan Terrace for Bio Video Daily Show. My pleasure, Dan. Thank, Thank you. you. This is Dan Terrace for Bio Video Daily Show, and I'm here with Eric Bongham Rudloff from Uppsala College in Sweden. Uh, hello, Eric. Hello. Uh, tell us what you're doing with the uh, EU and microalgae. Well, I'm uh, uh, coordinating to uh, EU projects that are dealing with uh, um, next generation sequencing, uh, the new technologies for uh, in very, very fast ways and very cheap ways and very rapidly uh, sequence the genomes or the nucleotides of organisms. Now why is there interest in microalgae in particular? Uh, this is very much because today we know that there are 15,000 biochemical products that are uh, economically interesting for the, 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 the humanity that has been isolated or identified from microalgae. But the amount of microalgae that we know at the moment is around 35,000 species. And estimates say that there are 200,000 to 800,000 different species of algae. And that means that there is a mountain to be discovered. And I understand that microalgae are used uh, for biofuels in some logical, scientific way. What are some of the other potential uses for microalgae? Well, there are discussions to uh, use it as uh, food for humans, mm -hmm. uh, also for feed for animals. And this is very much because you can uh, continuously grow algae, microalgae, in ways that uh, are very uh, uh, usable in areas where you cannot have uh, other kind of, of crops or, or grass to, to feed the animals. What about in oil spills? Are there bacteria that can clean sewage or oil spills? Any of that activity? Well, there are, I would say that there are many, many uh, areas that would be used where microalgae will be used for cleaning also even oil spills and all that. But to understand all this, we really need to uh, classify many more of these algaes. And today, with next-generation sequencing, uh, we can 
which was not possible just five, ten years ago, because we don't even know how to cultivate this uh, microalgae. Mm -hmm. We don't know the conditions, how they grow. But before even knowing that, it's not necessary anymore. We can just sequence a whole uh, soup of water isolated from oceans or mm -hmm. from ponds. Right, and so your background is uh, scientific, academic, and your funding is coming from the EU, is that correct? My fundings are coming from the EU and from the Swedish government. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's uh, purely academic, but we are involved in several projects where we have uh, partners from all Europe. And uh, the program you're on uh, later today, these uh, other people talking are also um, in biotechnology companies, is that correct? Yes, uh, the other members of the panel are people that uh, are coming from industry. So they have another view and perspective about microalgae production. And I presume they're not all the same view. I don't know, I don't know yet, but I, I guess that it's a different one, yes. <laughs> well, variety helps come up with a better answer, right? I guess so. Then it's a more lively discussion and uh, interesting for the public. And your job is to be the partner for this, one arm of the partner? Yes, I think that what we do in academia usually is uh, to be used for industry. And also, as we know today, uh, we are 7,000 7, million people living on Earth. And the, the calculation is that in very few years we're going to be 9,000 million. We need very rapidly to get new sources of food and uh, also fuels. So medicines are very interesting, but I would say that in the way that we are progressing, the need for very simple things like food and fuels will be even more important than medicines. Well, Eric, thank you very much. This is a very exciting area. This is Dan Terrace for Bio Video Daily Show. Thank you. in Boston for the International Biogenius Challenge. Being able to come here is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. The Biogenius Challenge is the Olympics of biotechnology. I came to win. And also have fun. <laughs>
Hello, I'm John Sterling, Editor-in-Chief of Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News. Uh, we've just finished a special session down on the exhibition floor called Gen 10 uh, Graduate Bash, and we also had our Gen 10 Awards. With me today are two of the award recipients. It's Jill Goldstein and Kevin McHugh. Uh, I'm going to ask them some questions about their research, about their uh, experience here at Bio today, and I think you're going to find them two very interesting people uh, because they sent to us some very interesting abstracts of the kind of research they're doing, and we're here today to show it to you. So, Jill, let's start with you. Why don't you say where you're from, where you're going to school, and you spent some time around bio here today. What's your general impression? What sort of struck you? What do you find interesting about the bio program? Sure. So I'm currently a PhD candidate at Yale University. I'm studying cell and developmental biology, in particular stem cell biology. This is my first bio convention, and I've really enjoyed just walking around and seeing all the different booths from publishing to government agencies to um, academic organizations. I've really also enjoyed how they have different regions um, to spotlight biology in different parts of the United States and throughout the world to get a little bit of cultural flair as well. Uh, my name is Kevin McHugh. I'm originally from Chicago, Illinois. Now I uh, go to school at Boston University in the biomedical engineering program and work at the Scapins Eye Research Institute. Um, while I was walking around today at, at the bioconference, the main thing I found interesting was the amount of um, industry contacts that I was able to make. So in other conferences I haven't found such a strong industry presence and here uh, there was a very strong one and that's something I'm interested in doing in the future as I look towards uh, potentially translatable um, research. Jill, my next question is what first piqued your interest in science and what caused you to pursue a career in this area? So I think I was actually interested in science initially from some crime scene shows. Um, I really liked the forensic science and the whole idea of being able to solve, to solve mysteries using science. And so that's what initially sparked my interest. Um, I really enjoyed chemistry and biology in high school and decided to go to an engineering school um, for, my, for my undergrad to focus on science. And I really just like learning about science and chemistry and biology in a living organism and so I've decided to continue doing that work um, okay. in my PhD. For me I think uh, my uncle was a very big influence. He um, was a genetic engineer himself and kind of opened my eyes to the things that were possible and initially everything seemed like science fiction uh, but now I see that some of these technologies are actually being implemented in the clinic and so initially I was interested but wanted to pursue it um, as an undergraduate. Didn't really know what I was getting into, but it turned out to be exactly what interests me now. Um, so I'd like to stick in the field and continue. I wish I could share with you the number of really fascinating abstracts we received in competition for the Gen 10 Awards. Uh, more than 10 could have actually won, but we need to whittle it down and we came up with the 10 best. Uh, with that in mind, Jill, talk about your specific research project, briefly, what is it that you're working on and what is it that you're trying to show in relation to the disease that you're studying? So in my lab, we're interested in understanding how tissues function and how they're maintained. And we are interested in how stem cells are able to maintain those tissues. And so we use the skin and hair follicle as a model to study stem cell activity. And this is a well-characterized system where the stem cells have been isolated and characterized molecularly. And the stem cells in the hair follicle are very important because if they're not properly regulated, then you could undergo tumorigenesis or skin cancer, um, you could have hair loss or hair overgrowth. And so we're really trying to use a lot of um, genomic methods to identify global cell intrinsic regulators of stem cell activity. Um, and we're also trying to identify some novel components of the stem cell niche involved in regulating hair, hair follicle cycling. Okay. Okay. My project um, involves 
finding a surgical treatment for age-related macular degeneration, or AMD. AMD is the most common cause of blindness in Americans today, and it's highly associated with aging. So what we're trying to do is use a tissue engineering approach um, and a microfabricated polymeric scaffold to regrow retinal pigment epithelium, which is a cell layer um, key in AMD. So if you can regrow and replace this cell layer in vitro, you can then implant it and hopefully it will um, restore the function that was lost due to the degeneration of the retina and restore functional vision to the patients with, afflicted with this disorder. As I was saying before, many of our 50 or 60 applications were of this degree of sophistication, and the tough thing for us on our advisory board was to bring it down to 10. As you just heard, both of these students are doing some very fascinating work, which hopefully will pay off in new therapies, diagnostic treatments, somewhere down the line. At our grad student bash, one of the big topics that came up was uh, jobs. Uh, when the students are finished with school, what career path are they going to choose? Is it going to be academia? Is it going to be industry? Are they going to be lawyers, international consultants? Uh, there's a wide range of options open to them. So I'd like to end this interview uh, with Jill and Kevin by asking each, what is your long-term career goal? So my long-term career goal is still in the works. I would say I'm currently leaning towards staying in academia. I really enjoy being at a university, working with students, teaching as well as doing research and coming up with my own ideas and experiments to test hypotheses. Um, so I'm planning to stay at least in academia to do a postdoc, um, but I'm certainly open to doing careers outside of academia, including biotech, um, pharmaceutical companies, science publishing. Um, I'm, I'm pretty pluripotent like a stem cell right now. <laughs> so. So my academic plans for now, or career plans, is to stay in academia as well. I hope uh, one day to be a professor at a university, um, working on translational technologies. Uh, I'd really be interested in creating some type of spin-out companies or working hand-in-hand -hand with industry um, to move something from the bench to the bedside, since that's really what we're all here for eventually, is developing these new therapies that are going to help people um, save lives and extend uh, quality of life. So that really would be my interest, to stay in academia, but work on these technologies. Well, I want to thank you both very much for attending today, and congrats on being Gen 10 winners. Uh, we're looking at our first Gen 10 meeting today as just the beginning of engaging graduate students more in what's going on in the biotechnology world. We have a number of ideas in mind we're going to share with them, they're going to share with us, and we'll eventually share with you all the Gen readers, uh, Gen website visitors, and all people in biotechnology, because as you can see, uh, we have some very bright, sophisticated, and witty students working in this very important field. Thanks for listening, and uh, goodbye for now. This is Dan Terrace for the Bio Video Daily Show. I'm here with Jeremy Abbott, who just moderated a fantastic program that was uh, led by Fareed Zakaria. So tell me what, uh, what you're about. Well, Scientific American Worldview is the magazine that I'm the publishing director of, and it literally looks at individual countries and how well they are poised to support bioscience innovation. Looks at a multitude of factors, how much R&D spend the government, um, you know, will um, invest in, in their country, the infrastructure, the strength of their IP laws, their patent laws, um, the strength of their education system, and it ranks them. The piece de resistance of the, of the Worldview Project is a listing where we rank countries according to how well they're poised to support innovation. And today's event was kind of a lot of the meta-conversations that happened around that. You know, how can governments really embolden the sector. It's a resource intensive sector. Bioscience is very expensive to do. So I think that what we have here is a really, we're, we're at kind of a, a crossroads. How can we continue to innovate when it's so expensive to do so? We have to change the regulatory model. We need to um, innovate intelligently and look at, you know, what you heard today on the panel. Uh, you know, innovations in India and in China made cell phone technology much cheaper. Uh, is that analogy relevant to drug discovery. How can we make cheaper drugs and again continue to innovate? And Jeremy, the world is flat 
And the it world certainly, is, certainly is flat in terms of science. It is definitely flat in terms of science. It's a global environment. Scientists are, you know, a lot of scientists that were trained in America used to stay here instead of companies. That's not the same. We have this whole phenomenon of sea turtles, you know, um, scientists going back to their homeland, uh, China, Malaysia, India, setting up companies there and strengthening that sector. You know, it's not preordained that the U.S. is a leader in bioscience. That happened for a lot of factors. Fareed Zakaria mentioned them today. The amount of uh, s spending in, in research we did as a result of the Cold War, post-World War II, the influx of immigrants that were scientists. So the U.S. has kind of been in this position for a long time, but I think that they're starting to realize it's not preordained, and in the future, who knows, maybe we won't be the leader in biotech or biosciences. But they're also going back to their country, but they're not going back in isolation. That's correct, too. It's a global They're market. bringing back their contacts with them. In an ideal world, innovation will be shared. Those, those parties that have innovated will be rewarded for that. And citizens and you know, medical need will be met because of these you know, innovative drugs, uh, you know, food solutions, water safety solutions. So I think that's what we're, you know, the, the flat world we live in, in an idealized world would be flat to the benefit of citizens, governments, companies, um, so that we could live in an equitable world. It's impressive when you go through the exhibit area how many clusters you see there. Now, what's the evidence that clusters work toward innovation? There is a lot of evidence for that, especially when you get to like, you know, incubators and companies partnering and kind of fueling the energy off of each other. Our magazine looks at it nationally, by nation state. We don't look at clusters as much, but clusters are a big part of it. Think of the U.S. People f always paint the U.S. in broad strokes. But if you think about where the bioscience activity is happening, Southern California, Northern California, um, Research Triangle Park, you know, Cambridge here in the Boston mm -hmm. area. So it, it would be silly to just think that nations as a whole are these homogenous scientific mm -hmm. powerhouses. You Clusters do matter. Right. And you also see centers of excellence in small places and places where government is investing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And again, you know, you can look at that statewide. Uh, for And you know, people look at Europe as one big entity, but that's obviously a bunch of different countries. Um, the way the United States is a bunch of different states, and they have different pr funding priorities, different reimbursement plans. So you're going to get degrees of differences. Mm -hmm. We still, from with our project, look at it at a national level, but you could make the case that, you know, looking at it in clusters and regionally is also just as important. Mm -hmm. Well, Jeremy, thank you very much. Thank you. This is Dan Terrace for the Bio Video Daily Show. Thank you very much.